Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, this is our Friday lecture, uh, the fifth in this contaminant transport chapter of our C544 uh, groundwater hydrology. This is Professor Obano. And today we are talking about biodegradation and monokinetics. So I'll explain what those uh, concepts are in a second. Um, yes, yeah, so we are still in the homogeneous reactions um, of this chapter. So last time we looked at um, reaction rates and reaction equilibrium, if you remember that. So you have the um, change of rate over time here at the beginning of a reaction, if you put it in a beaker, for example, right? And eventually for reversible reactions, they equilibrate uh, and you get these uh, equal rates towards the end when equilibrium is reached. Uh, and the amount of reactants obviously uh, diminishes in the beaker and the amounts of products uh, increases until again they reach equilibrium uh, and then in the middle there uh, you have the expression for the rate of the reaction uh, and the rate of the reaction for A for example is given by you know the change of A over time all right so you can see again from the graphic in the middle that A is a reactant so it goes down over time uh, and you can see that this can be illustrated by that uh, K, A to the P, B to the Q, uh, and then the reaction rate itself is P plus Q. Okay, so again, I invite you to review those concepts from last lecture, uh, and today we're moving on to biodegradation. Okay, so a bit of an introduction. Um, biodegradation is especially important in groundwater for uh, organic pollution, so I already mentioned several times that uh, hydrocarbons, so oils and gasoline, diesels, are uh, pervasive um, uh, pollutions, right? So I have an illustration here, obviously that's not groundwater, this is an ocean and a tanker, right? But a, um, uh, a spill of oil, you know, in the ocean is the typical visible, I guess, uh, pollution you can think of when you think of oil pollution. Um, another example that is more um, uh, linked to our groundwater uh, course, right, is fracking. You've probably all heard about fracking. Here at the bottom left, uh, where you can see that you have a well, basically, that is injecting some uh, liquid, some water into the formation and gets, you know, gas uh, back out. So usually that creates uh, wastewater uh, from the flow back, right, you're extracting wastewater so that you have to treat in some way or fashion and then either dispose of or reuse. Uh, here in the middle you can see all the um, shell plays, so fracking, you know, comes in it, or gas is extracted from shells typically uh, and again shell plays are those formations that uh, are used for fracking. And, but of course uh, these new technologies come at a cost or with unknowns at least and you know a lot of people have been uh, talking about pollution due to fracking right and again from uh, hydrocarbons uh, so here you can see a PNAS uh, paper uh, again PNAS being the proceedings of the National Academy of Science a very prestigious journal uh, talking about elevated levels again of diesel so diesel being a hydrocarbon obviously um, in you know near some fracking operations right so this is really a current issue this is a somewhat uh, recent paper from i believe 2012 uh, and again these wastewater tanks that i talked about it right here right right so you can see here this is an actual fracking operation a picture of it and you can see that there's water hazards and those surface ponds are used a lot to hold uh, wastewater and again if those things leak right now we have pollution in the soil eventually reaching the uh, aquifer uh, down below. Okay, so the good news though, all right, this is, you know, this whole intro um, slide was a bit on the pessimistic side, I guess there's issues with everything. Uh, now a bit of good news that just came out yesterday, you can see here April 23rd, 9 p.m. Uh, and this is just a news release in uh, Science, again, Science is 
you know, the famous journal Science uh, from the AAAS uh, talking about uh, that new Supreme Court decision yesterday uh, that basically groundwater feeding uh, lakes and rivers has to comply with the Clean Water Act. Uh, so this is a really uh, interesting and important uh, development. Uh, and then again, puts groundwater, you can see here, puts groundwater science at the center of the decisions about how to regulate uh, water pollution. So hopefully, I mean, I don't have to preach to the choir if you guys are, uh, you know, taking this class, obviously you're aware of the importance of water resources, but this is just another example of sort of, you know, real life, you know, uh, recent or even uh, actual, you know, importance of groundwater in the news and in the policies. Um, okay, so here I will ex illustrate. So last time we've talked about first order, uh, first order reaction rates, right? So I explained that you can have first order or pseudo first order rates when one of the reactants is in uh, large excess and this is sort of the object of your activity due Monday, right? Uh, that paper that I gave you about the iron and iron oxidation uh, with, where you have a pseudo first order rate uh, that you use, right? So all this we covered last time. So a lot of things, again, for example, nitrate uptake in a stream, uh, typically, right, uh, we lump everything else so we don't really look at uh, multiple component reactions, we just, you know, look at um, the nitrate concentration downstream and we see that typically it conforms to a first order process and then we can extract a first order rate from it, right? So here's a, an illustration for the exponential growth versus the uh, logistic growth, right? So imagine instead of Chemicals, now let's talk about population growth, just because it's maybe a little more intuitive. Uh, so imagine on the y-axis here we have the number of organisms, and again on the x-axis we have time, right? So let's think of uh, population growth. So again, imagine a population of animals, for example, right, that come in, in contact with a new habitat, right? They will start growing. So they can grow again exponentially uh, or they can have some limitations. So ex example, you know, if you have a band of lions, you know, coming into a territory, obviously they can only grow, you know, so, you know, a territory can only support so many lions, right? Because the resources are limited, right? Illustrated by that uh, dash blue line here. Uh, and that's what we call the logistic growth. Uh, and again, the carrying capacity of the habitat or the maximum population is basically the maximum number of uh, individuals that this habitat can um, can support. Exponential growth and the um, uh, logistic growth on the right. Now, what is the difference, you know, mathematically between those two? Well, so the exponential we've seen a bunch, right? So dn, dt, again, the change in number of uh, individuals, so let's say lions, over time equals some um, R max times the number of lions, right? So the the uh, growth rate, right, the, or the reaction uh, rate before, but the growth rate is a constant, it's always the same, and so, you know, we have a doubling time for growth. Now for the logistic growth, now the um, growth rate actually depends on the number of lions, right? Uh, so there's two things that intervene, the carrying capacity, that K, and the number of lions, okay? So, again, K is the carrying capacity, is that, you know, maximum number of lions that we can have in that habitat. So obviously K minus N, right? So when the number of lions is at capacity, K minus K is zero, right? And nothing grows, right? There's no, the growth rate itself is zero, so now there's no change over time. So D and DT is zero, and this is our equilibrium. Right, when we're at equilibrium, right, the growth rate is zero. There's no more uh, reaction, there's no more change in the number of individuals. Uh, at early times, when there's no lions, basically, or there's you know, one lion, let's say, we can grow as fast as we want. So imagine uh, now k over uh, k is one, right? So again, if n equals zero, k over k is one, right? And now the uh, rate of change is R max, right? So K minus N is K, K over K is one, so R max. So there is a maximum growth rate, 
right? Just again, look at the left, just like if it was an exponential. So again, early on, and I already illustrated this before, but early on, it grows as if, whoops, as if it was an exponential. But again, because there's that n dependence at some point, right? Uh, the number of individuals, you know, limit the, the, the growth rate, so we grow slower and slower and slower and slower. Okay, so this is illustrated here again, and maybe now we can understand this figure a little better, right? The difference between the amount, so the concentration or the number of lions, if you will, and the growth rate, right? So you can see that for a... Uh, for a logistic growth, right, for a population growth, the growth rate actually decreases over time. Again, this is the forward rate here in red. So it decreases over time, just like I explained, you know, uh, a second ago. Uh, and of course, the uh, reactants the, uh, is also decreasing over time, but that's different. The number of lions, if you will, is growing over time, right? The products, if you will, is growing over time but the forward rate is decreasing because at some point there's too many lions. Okay, now what does that mean for chemical species, right? Going back to the chemical explanation. Well, it's the exact same thing. We've seen before, DCDT equals mu C. This is your first order rate, right? So if mu is a constant and doesn't depend on C, that would be an exponential growth. We've done that last time. First order rate reaction. Now, if the growth rate or if the reaction rate now depends on the concentration, right, or on some kind of a limiting uh, substrate. Now the growth rate is not a constant and we have that logistic or that mon what we call monokinetic for uh, reactions, right? So here you can see that before we had uh, K minus N over K for the log logistic uh, growth, right? So here it's slightly uh, modified, but this is the same idea, right? So S is the limiting substrate concentration and Ks here is the half uh, velocity is down here, right? Ks is the concentration of that limiting substrate at which the speed here, mu, is half of the maximum speed, okay? So you can recognize, you know, how similar that is to a logistic growth. And again, it's the same concepts, right? So again, now our... Uh, reaction rate or the rate of change is, you know, depends on a substrate that is a limiting factor, okay? So we get the same dynamics um, than before. Okay, so now if we look at more complex equations, right, like a more realistic uh, example, but you can see here we're getting into pretty complicated um, chemistry, uh, yet it's simple, right? So if we break it down the way I did, so if you think of the first order rate, you understand that now, if you think of that logistic growth and you understand that, uh, then you can see how those equations make sense, right? So here we have essentially a, a rate of reaction, right? So that's what we had R or K or whatever you want to call it before. So HU here, if we look at the definition, it's a maximum hydrocarbon utilization rate. So this is a set of equations, right? I should introduce that before I move on. This is a set of equations actually describing the dynamics of an oil spill, let's say, uh, that is cleaned up by biofilms, okay? So H is going to be your hydrocarbon concentration. Uh, it's here, hydrocarbon concentration, excuse me, in the pore fluid, right? So this is, you know, some kind of uh, hydrocarbon, you know, spilled. So it can be oil, it can be gasoline, it can be methane for the fracking, doesn't matter what it is, it's some hydrocarbon that we'll use to uh, get energy from. So if we have bacteria in the soil that can uh, use this hydrocarbon for energy, then they burn oxygen as they do that, right? So you can see how these two are coupled, the, the H, what we call H here in these equations, which is hydrocarbon, and the oxygen, which is obviously that we use to burn the hydrocarbon. Okay, so now we have two couple differential equation, one for the hydrocarbon, one for the oxygen. And of course, the result of all that is growth, right? So we have bacteria, again, that, that feed on this hydrocarbon. So the hydrocarbon, the substrates, if you will, are going to change concentration. So the oxygen is going to disappear. Uh, the hydrocarbon is going to disappear. And in, in exchange, we get this energy, which is basically biomass, right? We get growth. 
growth or biomass or you know more lions, more bacteria. Okay, so we couple those three things so we can model the evolution of a plume, for example, of hydrocarbon as it is consumed by uh, the biofilm. Now again, there's a growth rate, so you can recognize all those equations are exactly the same form as we had before. Now we have those monokinetics, and you can see now we are stacking them, right? So because there's a coupling, now we need to have uh, the hydrocarbon substrate and the oxygen substrate, right? So the hydrocarbon depends on the oxygen and vice versa. So now they're coupled, so we have two terms of the monokinetics. And we still have that maximum growth rate in front of it, right? Just like before. And now MT, again, is because we're coupling to the biofilm, right? So it depends on the amount of biofilm we have, right? So all those three things are coupled together. Okay, sorry. So that G here is just the coupling between the hydrocarbon and the oxygen. So, you know, some hydrocarbon are very label and some hydrocarbon are, are very um, refractory. So, you know, depending on how easy basically it is to burn that carbon, there's a ratio of oxygen to carbon that comes into play. Similarly here, we have a yield, meaning that for each mole of hydrocarbon, right, some, um, some hydrocarbon are yield more energy basically than others, right? So the yield is basically the amount of mass of uh, microorganisms that you get per mole or per mass of hydrocarbon you burn, right? So that's that Y here, the grams of cells per gram of hydrocarbon. Again, you can see that there's a mass per mass type of deal because the biofilms are basically uh, like a sorption surface, like a surface sort of deal. And so anyways, so everything works, but the main point of this slide, right, is here you have some monokinetics for this hydrocarbon and oxygen because, you know, when oxygen becomes limiting, so if you're burning hydrocarbon with oxygen, at some point you're going to run out of it and it's going, it's going to be a limiting factor. So you're going to get these types of curve where at some point is the maximum, you know, amount of mass you can do because, the you know, the microbes can only grow so much. Okay, so now if you have a biofilm that can um, start using nitrate, right? So if they run out of oxygen, right? They have that maximum amount that they can reach. Uh, if now they can turn to nitrate, which is available in the aquifer to do the denitrification, so to extract energy, right? To keep growing, if you will, extract energy from this same reaction. Well, now they can, you know, have a second different growth rate for the nitrate, so on and so forth, right? So this is your redox processes where you extract energy where you can find it, basically, you don't go down that cascade. Uh, but again, for just the hydrocarbon and an aerobic uh, uh, reaction, so using the oxygen to burn the sugar to respire, uh, then, you know, this is your entire coupling. Now, notice here that you also have some first order uh, right here, right? So if you look at B here, uh, and of course I don't have it, yes, decay rate, right? So this is basically a death process, right? So here we're growing from the organic carbon in the formation with some yield again, uh, but we're dying, you know, because that's just how it is, right? So cells have a life expectancy, so there's some death, constant death rate. So this is a first order process for death, first order process, process for growth, depending on the organic carbon in the, in the aquifer, and monokinetic for uh, both the hydrocarbon, the oxygen, and the biomass, depending on the hydrocarbon and the oxygen that are limiting substrates for it. Okay, so now we can analyze those equations and understand how they're coupling and uh, understand how they work. Finally, uh, we're getting to the, towards the end of those lectures, so you can see those big, ugly equations that, you know, maybe if you looked at it at the beginning of this class, would have, you know, scared you uh, a bit, uh, and now you can actually understand them, right? So we, we know everything that's in here. Like if I gave you this equation, by now you should be able to interpret what they mean. So what, all we did here is add the transport, right? So we have our dispersion, our uh, advection. Uh, note that this is an organic contaminant spill, so there is some retardation, right? It sticks around to other organics, and I explained that before, again, sort of briefly, but we know that this is a retardation factor. We've, we've seen it before, right? This is your retardation factor for H, okay, that we switch to the right-hand side. Okay, so we have dispersion, advection, retardation, we've done that. And now we have, again, retardation, same thing as for the first order, right? If we switch it side, then it modifies the maximum growth rate. 
and we have the limiting substrate uh, dependency, right? Same thing for the oxygen, same thing for the mass, right? So now the dispersion and the uh, velocity are obviously properties of the aquifer, right? So the water moves. Uh, the retardation, again, is only for the organic stuff, not for uh, the oxygen. The oxygen is just dissolved and, you know, acts as a, a passive tracer for as far as the retardation. But again, here we have that same dependency here. Uh, and for the biomass, well, the biomass can move, you know, around with the... Um, can move around with the fluid if they're in solution, right? So if they're not biofilms on the surface, but they're like cells uh, flowing around. And again, this is where the filtration theory uh, could come in handy to see what we can do for those cells that may be filtered out of the solution. But let's say the cells that are in the bulk move with the bulk and again, do the process of you know the monokinetics and the first order stuff that we've just talked about. So this big old equation at the end here, coupled with the oxygen and the hydrocarbon spill, tells you how the uh, population of microbes basically evolve in that plume to use it up. Okay, so we can model, we can model that very efficiently and find ways to remediate that plume, for example, depending on what the growth rate of these uh, things are. Okay, finally, uh, I'd like to conclude this lecture on uh, monokinetics with, again, a recent example of a an interesting, I think, uh, Nature paper. So you can see here, this is uh, published very recently, a couple of weeks ago, in Nature Geoscience. So again, a very uh, prestigious uh, journal in geoscience. And you can see this is the river groundwater interface as a hotspot for arsenic release. So I haven't talked about arsenic too much in this class, uh, although it is a very important you know, topic for groundwater. So a lot of groundwater work and remediation um, uh, considers arsenic because obviously arsenic is you know, a poison, so it's very dangerous and a lot of people depend on groundwater to drink. So when there's you know, those two things together, when there's arsenic in your drinking water, uh, that's a big uh, health issue in a lot of places you know, on earth. Uh, so a lot of places this is actually a public health you know, uh, serious issue and, and, and we, we notice that there's more and more arsenic in that water and you know, the question is always, well, where does it come from and why, right? What are the processes? that make the arsenic concentration so high and so lethal to the point that a lot of wells have to be shut down because we can't use it anymore. Uh, and again, you know, the point being here uh, that this is a pretty advanced, you know, paper, very recent 2020. I mean, this is current issues, basically. And if you read this paper, you could actually understand, you know, all the modeling, hopefully by now. Uh, look at this overall degradation rate of organic matter. So now OM is organic matter. So we have a degradation rate of organic matter and you recognize all those things are just uh, stacking up of monokinetics, right? So you have a maximum rate, maximum rate, time sum, you know, this is your Ks for the C ox, this is your Ks for the nitrification, right? So on and so forth. So you can actually see how those things work, right? This is just all the same. So now we have a whole suite of, you know, oxygen, nitrate, sulfur, and iron, right? So this is the cascade of the redox processes that we've seen before, right? So now we include just more of them, basically. It's the exact same thing. Now, if we look at, on the right-hand side here, a replenishment of iron oxides at the river aquifer interface. And again, I'm interested in that interface, you know, personally, but just again, just to show you that by now, you should be able to understand those, you know, really good modern papers, basically. Uh, river aquifer, uh, including the mole, through a zeroth order rate expression. So we know what that is, right? So we can literally read that thing and understand what happens in the mole. Uh, the composition of the iron oxide was defined to contain some amount of arsenic to iron ratio, right? So there's a ratio of arsenic to iron. So what we're saying here is that the iron oxide is carrying this uh, arsenic around basically right and so again this is just a simple percentage um, and finally here a code availability at the end of the paper says all codes used uh, in this study basically are modflow which is what we've been using right your GMS uh, software is modflow basically it's just a wrapper for modflow but that's what we've been using find a difference code in the background and look at that uh, MT3 DMS which is the one you've been using for your uh, landfill uh, 
projects, right? So this is exactly what we've been uh, using. This one is also available in GMS. So again, the codes they used are basically codes that you've been using. The equations they used are, you know, things that hopefully by now you understand how they work. And literally you could, you know, take this paper and reproduce uh, what they did, right? And this is a very advanced thing. And basically that's the idea for your activity for Monday as well, that paper that I gave you, uh, where you can go through, you know, and kind of reproduce uh, uh, research that is current research pretty much. Uh, okay, I think I'll conclude there and thank you very much. I uh, will see you next time.